So thanks everyone for being here. My name is Mika. I'm a PhD student at UC Davis working with Sharon Strauss and Santiago Ramirez, and I'm excited to tell you about some of my dissertation research. So we live in a time of rapid environmental change and understanding how organisms respond to those changes in their environments and to novel environments is one of the big questions in biology. And in the case of herbivorous insects, there have been a lot of examples of contemporary uh, range expansions. And in those cases, those herbivores will often come into contact with novel host plants. And that's often due to uh, human economic activity, also agricultural activity, and more recently, climate change. And in cases where the interaction history between an herbivore and its novel host plant is known, they can be valuable opportunities to study the evolution of dietary breadth and host plant uh, associations. So this is an example of the mountain pine beetle, which has recently transitioned from its ancestral host of lodgepole pine onto jack pine. And this is an example of the Melissa butterfly, which has transitioned from its ancestral hosts in the Fabaceae of the Great Basin onto cultivated and feral populations of alfalfa. So the species that I work on that has recently undergone a big range expansion is the monarch butterfly. So most people are familiar with the monarch from its ancestral range in North America, where it migrates. But over the past 150 years or so, it's undergone this big global range expansion, including these two contemporary uh, expansions into the Pacific and the Atlantic, and then also a more sort of ancient expansion into the Caribbean and Central and South America. So for these contemporary expansions, it's thought that it was facilitated by human introduction of the monarch's host plants to those locations and then the monarch dispersed naturally to those places. So this range expansion in the monarch has led to this interesting contrast between its ancestral range and its introduced range in patterns of host plant use. So in the ancestral range where the monarch migrates, its migration brings it into contact with about 100 different species of milkweed host plants, and it's been documented feeding from about 30 of those. By contrast, in the introduced populations, Monarchs typically only have access to a single species of host plant, and that plant is often an evolutionarily novel species that they've had no uh, contact with before. <coughs> so this host plant species, Gonfocarpus, is native to subtropical Africa. It's uh, chemically and physiologically distinct from the North American milkweed fauna, but it's the primary host for monarchs in Australia and some of the Hawaiian islands. And this species, Asclepius carasavica, uh, is sort of widely introduced around the world as an ornamental plant. It's from the American milkweed fauna, um, but it's not something that the ancestral migratory populations utilize frequently. So for my study that I'll be talking about here, uh, I'm focusing on these two independent expansions out of North America and into the Pacific, so I have three populations from Hawaii, Australia, and Guam, and then another expansion into Puerto Rico, and I'll be comparing those with the ancestral populations from North America. Uh, this is again just a summary of the host plants that I used and the monarch populations in this experiment. So I've got the ancestral North American populations and four associated Asclepius species, then two species from the introduced range, in Hawaii, Australia, Guam, and Puerto Rico. And I should also add that uh, the species that I'm considering here span about 30 million years of divergence. So the main question that I'm interested in here is whether uh, monarch populations around the world show a pattern of local adaptation to these host plant assemblages that they encounter. And just for a little refresher, local adaptation, people often think about it in terms of uh, these symmetrical crossing reaction norms where in this case, you may expect for the ancestral population of monarchs to outperform these derived populations on the ancestral hosts and vice versa, but local adaptation need not be symmetrical like in that previous example. You can also get examples where reaction norms don't actually cross, but there's still an underlying pattern of local adaptation, but it implies something different about the mechanism. The second question that I'll talk about is whether monarch dietary breadth is associated with overall mean performance across hosts. And here my prediction is that the ancestral North American populations, which have a broad dietary breadth, when you rear them across a range of host plants, that they'll have higher performance across those hosts. 
So the experiment that I did was this fully factorial greenhouse rearing experiment. So I raised all six of the monarch populations on all six of the host plant species. Um, in these figures, the cells that are in red correspond to sympatric combinations, so a monarch population that overlaps in range with a particular milkweed species, and then all of the black are allopatric, non-overlapping combinations. Uh, I reared caterpillars from 76 maternal families uh, from all of these different populations, and that entailed bringing live butterflies collected in the field back to Davis, having them lay eggs and then putting uh, like hours old newly hatched larvae onto live host plants inside of mesh bags. Uh, the performance measures that I looked at were larval mass on day eight. This is what the caterpillars look like at that stage. And I originally added about 4,000 of those newly hatched caterpillars and took mass measurements from about 3,000 caterpillars. I also looked at larval survival on day eight. This is an example of a caterpillar that didn't make it, RIP. <laughs> and then a bunch of other performance metrics. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly going to be focusing on larval mass on day eight, since I think that's a performance metric that has pretty clear fitness implications for larval lepidopterans like this. Uh, it's good to develop quickly, because that's when they're most vulnerable to predators and parasitoids. So uh, growing fast is good in this case. So the way that I quantified local adaptation was with the sympatric allopatric contrast. And the basic idea is to compare the performance on all of these sympatric combinations to all the performance in all of the allopatric combinations. And the magnitude of the difference between those summarizes the local adaptation effect. In all the figures that I go through, they'll look something like this. So this is just for one particular milkweed species, Asclepias incarnata. On the x-axis, have all of the different monarch populations and then their mass <coughs> after eight days of development. And each of the points in these figures corresponds to the mean performance of a single maternal family from one of those populations on a given host plant. And the contrast that I'm interested in are sympatric versus allopatric, red versus black, and then also the ancestral North American populations in blue versus the derived populations in green. So again, revisiting that first question, is there local adaptation in the system? I found that yes, when caterpillars were reared on their sympatric host plants, they were about 16% larger on day eight than caterpillars that were reared on their allopatric hosts. So that result is summarized here. And then this is just all of the raw data for all of those possible host plant by population combinations. And then sort of breaking that effect down, uh, one possibility would be that the popula monarch populations associated with these novel hosts uh, those derived populations might have an advantage on this novel host, but I didn't find evidence for that. So in Hawaii and Australia, when they're feeding on this Gomphocarpus host plant, they don't actually have any advantage compared to these other naive <coughs> populations that have never seen this host plant before. And if anything, they perform worse than the naive North American populations. But then on the flip side, when you bring those derived populations back onto their ancestral species, so these are the four ancestral North American host plants, there you see a really pronounced difference in performance. So the ancestral populations outperform those derived populations by about 41%. Uh, I should mention that for all of the other performance metrics that involve larval growth rate and performance, um, I also found this sympatric allopatric effect. Uh, but not when I looked at adult performance metrics, so things like adult size and cardinalite sequestration. I didn't find a sympatric allopatric effect there. And so uh, to summarize this part, yes, I did find a local adaptation effect, and it was driven primarily by a loss of performance in these derived populations when they were brought back onto their ancestral hosts. And this is the result that I'm excited about because it's something that people have seen in other systems before. So this is a little bit more simple. It's a sort of a two by two design, again with this Melissa blue butterfly that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So in this study, they took populations of this butterfly associated with the novel host, alfalfa, and compared its performance to populations associated with the ancestral host, astragalus. And what they found was that on this novel host plant, 
The alfalfa-associated populations had a modest performance advantage relative to the naive populations, but that when you bring this population back onto its ancestral host, its performance is way lower than that of the ancestral population. So sort of similar to the result that I found. And they went even further and actually uh, generated SNPs for these populations and were able to demonstrate that the uh, performance in uh, this experiment uh, doesn't show evidence for strong genotypic trade-offs. So uh, you might expect if there were really strong performance trade-offs between genotypes on these two hosts uh, that there would be uh, sort of SNP associations that fall out in these blue boxes. But instead what they found is that most of the SNPs were conditionally neutral. So they had either a positive or a negative effect in one context but no effect in other contexts. And so I think that's uh, probably also what's going on in my system. In these very small derived populations, uh, uh, neutral effects like drift are probably really important. The second question that I looked at was whether monarch dietary breadth was associated with mean performance across hosts. And here, I did find that yes, the ancestral North American populations that have broader dietary breadth do in fact have about 35% higher mean performance across the full range of host plants compared to those derived populations. And, but for this result, I should just say that uh, dietary breadth is also conflated with migratory status. So the North American populations migrate, these other populations do not. It's also confounded with range size. So the North American ones occupy a whole continent whereas some of the populations that I'm working with, like from Guam, it's one-sixth the size of Rhode Island, so not very big. And then because of those things, the population sizes in these uh, populations are many orders of magnitude different from each other. So the conclusions are that in this system, we see that local adaptation to host plants has developed over contemporary time scales. Um, I should have added that we think uh, this is about a thousand generations since they've been established in these Pacific Island populations. Um, and this pattern is driven primarily by poor performance of these derived populations when brought back onto their ancestral host plants. And then also that broad dietary breadth seems to be associated with higher mean performance across those species. And so with that, I'll thank um, especially these undergrads who helped me with all of this research, then Sharon and Santiago for uh, helping come up with the ideas that I'm presenting here. All of these folks who sent me butterflies from the field, uh, and then also funding sources. And with like 10 seconds to spare, I'll take questions. Yeah, I think it's coffee break time. So if you guys have questions. <laughs>